Greetings and welcome. My name is Bruce Kane, and I'm the director of Stanford's Bill Lane Center for the American West. And I'm also a professor of political science and a pre-core fellow. Thank you for joining us today. Today's virtual briefing will highlight key findings from a new joint study by researchers at the Stanford Pre-Core Institute and um, MIT's uh, uh, center, uh, the Abdul Latif Jamul Food and Water Systems Lab at MIT that reassesses the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant's potential value in helping California meet its increasing challenges of climate change by providing clean, safe, and reliable electricity, water, and hydrogen fuel for Californians. To put the topic of Diablo Canyon in a broader context of transitioning to a clean energy future, we've asked two distinguished scientists from Stanford who both served in the Obama administration to make some brief remarks first before moving to the report itself. So first, please join me in welcoming Stanford Professor of Physics and former U.S. Secretary of Energy, Stephen Chu. Stephen? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think my remarks can be very brief. Um, we are not in a position in the near-term future in, uh, to go to 100% renewable energy. And uh, there will be times when the wind blows, doesn't blow, the sun doesn't shine and we will need some power that we can actually turn on dispatch at will. And that leaves two choices, either fossil fuel or nuclear. And if you use fossil fuel, then you need to capture as much as 90, 100% of the carbon and sequester, and also you have nuclear. And so I believe that nuclear presents a very good option, especially nuclear power plants that have been built. Um, the CapEx is, been invested, uh, and in particular, Diablo Canyon, a lot of the upgrades were made in anticipation for applying for a 20-year extension, which the National the Nuclear Regulatory Agency gave uh, every uh, belief that they would look favorably upon an application. The distressing thing is in 2018, uh, PG&E pulled the application when, I, when that happened, I called up people at PG&E and they just said that the uh, community attitude was that it was not, uh, they were being pressured to turn off the nuclear power plant. In addition, there were other things, uh, for example, water intake, uh, new regulations and other things, uh, uh, heat cooling uh, that they said looked uh, too hard and they were just going to close it down. And this new report says that you can have use other things for the nuclear reactors, uh, desalinization, things of that nature that uh, shed new light on the economic viability of this. But also I just want to conclude by saying in the examples of countries that have turned off their nuclear power uh, with perhaps the hope of some that you would just go to more renewable energy, clean energy like solar and wind. The experience in Japan, the experience in Germany is that's not what happened. Uh, they built more fossil fuel plants and there were more carbon emissions. And so we should take note of the earlier examples of other countries doing this and consider again very strongly uh, in order to uh, combat climate change in, in the best possible way, I think nuclear power for the next uh, uh, extension period uh, is something that we should really consider and ask PG&E to reconsider. So with that, I'll stop. Again, next we turn to Arun Majundar, who is a professor uh, in the engineering school and was undersecretary of uh, energy in the Obama administration. Well, thank you, Bruce. And first of all, let me congratulate the authors um, both at MIT as well as at Stanford for putting this report together. And I, I just want to place this and I want to build on what Steve uh, said and also want to place this report on a broader context of nuclear. Um, we are seeing that nuclear, uh, the current plants of nuclear plants are under threat because of what is called the business model of nuclear. 
because of the fact that the electricity prices of the wholesale market are reducing um, uh, because of renewables being integrated, cheap natural gas, et cetera, and thereby it is difficult to sustain nuclear. Well, that's the argument. I think this report, uh, first of all, talks about nuclear as an electricity source itself and says that this is a viable uh, approach to doing so. But it also provides the broader business model context of can it be used to do other things? And it shows that you can potentially uh, produce hydrogen at $2 a kilogram and potentially cheaper in the future and also look at desalination and, uh, and address water needs, which, um, uh, you know, as California and many other places around the world um, uh, are going to face. And it also does a kind of a combination of things and optimize it. And I, I would really encourage people who are interested in this subject to read this report. I just think that, you know, this is, while that is fantastic, it also lays out the challenges, et cetera but also lays out the opportunities. And I think it's very important to look at those opportunities, especially as Steve mentioned, there's a sunken cost already there, as opposed to building new things and, and that has its own time scale, et cetera. I wanna point out one more opportunity that perhaps uh, could be considered in the future by the team and by others. If you're putting this, placing this in the context of decarbonizing an economy, which as the um, uh, as the report correctly pointed out in California, that goal is 2045. It is more than electricity. The, the most difficult thing to decarbonize is industrial heat, process heat. And nuclear in its conversion from heat to electricity takes a hit about, you know, the efficiency is about 30 to 35%. So if the electricity is $40 a megawatt hour, the heat is much cheaper. And I think it's very important to use the heat for other things. And in, in, the, in, the, in the report, it's pointed out, but there are other applications of industrial heat which cannot be forgotten. For example, if you look at the, the industry of steel and cement making, yes, you require high temperature heat, but if the low temperature heat can be provided by nuclear, it reduces a tremendous amount of fossil fuel use if you have to, and thereby reduces the burden of carbon capture. One of the most difficult things, and we're now realizing that you cannot get to net zero economy without negative emissions. And if you look at the negative emissions technology of capturing CO2 from the atmosphere, 90% of the energy need that you have is, is heat. And if you have a low carbon, a zero carbon source of heat and, and use it for direct air capture, atmospheric removal of CO2, and those plants can be placed anywhere, I think that's a huge opportunity that should not be missed out. And so if California is thinking of trying to make a net zero economy, and, uh, and it has plans and it, it can be the leader of, of, of uh, CO2, atmospheric removal of CO2, this is the opportunity to do that. So let me also place that in the context of the broader context of what the, what the United States needs and what the world needs. Thank you very much. And I just, again, wanna congratulate the authors of the report for laying it out in both the challenges as well as the opportunities. Thank you very much, Arun. <clears throat> So next, uh, we want to turn to the study itself. And uh, we have uh, four speakers. We will start with uh, Jacobo Bongiorno. Uh, and he, he we will hand it off to E.J. Bake uh, and MIT professor of water, John Leanhard. And then finally, uh, a, a senior consultant at Luc Lucid Canalyst, Justin Aborn. So Jacobo, it's your turn. Thank you, Bruce. I hope everybody can hear me and see me clearly. I'm Jacopo Bozona, Professor of uh, Nuclear Science and Engineering at MIT, also Director of the uh, Center for Advanced Nuclear Energy Study uh, System, excuse me, and the, uh, one of the co-PIs, one of the uh, principal investigators of, of this study. Um, I want to start by thanking the uh, Freecourt uh, Center and Professors Heishu and Mejundur for hosting our presentation today. Uh, my team at MIT and and Stanford is uh, passionate about uh, energy, technology, and the environment, and uh, we can't think of a better of a better venue to present the findings of our study. The study itself started uh, a little bit over a year ago uh, at the initiative of myself, Professor Sally Benson at uh, 
at Stanford University, and we decided to title it an assessment of the Diablo Canyon nuclear plant for zero carbon electricity desalination and hydrogen production. I'm going to share the screen so you can see the slides that I will use to guide the discussion. So, all right, so first, a few words about background and motivation uh, for the study if you're attending this webinar. Most likely you're familiar with the, the, the history of uh, Diablo Canyon, but uh, it's useful for recap. So in January 2018, the uh, California Public Utilities Commission approved a multi-party settlement to shut down the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant upon expiration of the operating license of the second unit, uh, which is in 2025. Uh, first unit license expires in 2024. Um, at the moment, Diablo Canyon provides about 8% of California's in-state electricity production that translates to 15% of its carbon-free electricity production. Um, in its decision back in 2018, the commission stated that the plant was not cost-effective to continue in operation, that it was not needed for system reliability, and that its value for reducing greenhouse gas emissions was unclear. So this is back 2018. Now fast forward three and a half years, and things have changed. Um, there have been some new opportunities and some new challenges. Um, in aggregate, it is these opportunities and these challenges that have led uh, the team at Stanford University and Massachusetts Institute of Technology to re-examine the potential value of Diablo Canyon in addressing some of the important challenges that California is facing in the coming decades. So what has changed since 2018? Several things. First and foremost, the properly aggressive decarbonization targets that the state of California has set for itself over the next few decades. These are embodied by Senate Bill 100 and Executive Order B5518. There has also been a variety of studies, including a few at MIT and Stanford, affirming the need for clean, firm, or dispatchable uh, zero carbon um, energy capacity of the type that can be provided by with the power plants like Diablo Canyon. The intention here, of course, is to help in the decarbonization of the electricity grid. Uh, there have been some reliability ch challenges in, in the Kaizo service here in California on the electric grid, uh, as exemplified by the brownouts in 2020 and other occurrences. Uh, there is a long, prolonged, I should say, severe drought um, that is putting a lot of areas in the state uh, at, with a shortage of, uh, of, of uh, fresh water. There is also a desire to preserve public land for future generations. This is embodied by the 30 by 30 executive order. And last but not least, after a very long um, review and examination of the uh, seismic hazards at the Diablo Canyon, the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission concluded that Diablo Canyon can withstand even the most severe earthquakes that can occur at that particular, at that particular uh, site. Um, one thing I want to point out that is a very important piece of information and background is the funding for the study was all from internal university resources and, and donations. We did not seek or accept any money from industry for the study. So this is for an independent MIT and Stanford University. Okay, so a few words about, about my team. I already mentioned Professor Sally Benson. She's Professor of Energy Resources Engineering at Stanford. Uh, she currently has a position in the Obama excuse me, in the Biden Harris administration, and so she cannot be with us here. Working with Sally, an exceptionally talented PhD student, uh, E.J. Bay, who is going to uh, present her findings in a few minutes. On the MIT side, along with myself, uh, Professor John Liener, he is the Abdul Latif Jamil Professor of Water and Mechanical Engineering. He is our water desalination expert. Uh, Dr. John Parsons, a senior lecturer and the MIT uh, Sloan School of Management is our go-to person for finances. And then two very capable PhD students working primarily with Professor Leonard on water desalination, Andrew Boma and Quantum Wade. And on the specific question of hydrogen generation at Diablo Canyon, uh, we were joined by Justin Haber, who is a senior consultant at UC Campus. All right, so I'm going to spend a few minutes first um, telling you what was the scope of the study and then uh, focusing on high level findings from the study. So we looked at essentially four product streams or revenue streams. I think about this as four different modes of operation for Diablo Canyon. The first is the most obvious is what Diablo Canyon has been doing for the past 35 years, essentially producing uh, low carbon dispatchable electricity for the grid. And the question here is what would be the potential contribution of Diablo Canyon 
to that mission if it was allowed to um, operate beyond the 2025 deadline. Uh, the second question was about the potential for Diablo Canyon to produce low cost, zero carbon uh, uh, fresh water at a desalination plant that would be co-located with, uh, with, with the plant itself. And so one way to produce uh, fresh water from seawater is a so-called reverse osmosis process, which essentially pushes seawater through membranes and separates salinity from, uh, from the water that, that is used. That process requires electricity, which of course the Apple Canyon can provide it. That electricity is carbon free, then the fresh water that is produced is also carbon free. The third product stream is hydrogen. As California seeks to decarbonize its transportation sector, there are essentially two options. Either the transportation sector is electrified, in which case there is going to be a need for a much higher uh, uh, capacity or power capacity on the grid, or you can go with uh, fuel cell vehicles. And those fuel cells require hydrogen as fuel. Hydrogen is not a primary energy source. It has to be produced from something else. One way to do it is to electrolyze water to break the molecule of uh, the molecule H2O and get hydrogen that way. That process, which is called electrolysis, uh, can be assisted by heat, but primarily requires electricity. Again, if that electricity input is carbon free, then the hydrogen uh, that is produced is also carbon free. And then last, poly, what we call polygeneration, which is think about it as basically a mixture of the above um, of the above modes. In this scenario, the uh, Diablo Canyon would operate always at uh, at full power, and the uh, power output of the plant would be triaged effectively, would be diverted uh, at different times of the day or at different time of the years towards sometimes grid electricity, sometimes hydrogen generation, and sometimes uh, water desalination. In all these analyses for all these different scenarios, my team looked at or accounted for the operating, operation maintenance and fuel costs associated with the uh, daily operation of, of the Apple Canyon, as well as the additional capital cost required to meet the uh, California uh, regulations for protection of marine life that mostly translates to the installment of a new intake structure that would serve the uh, nuclear power plant and the uh, desalination plant and hydrogen plant should those plants also be co-located at the site, as well as the cost modifications to the plant and other facilities needed for the production of hydrogen and desalinated water. So we think that we have accounted for essentially all the uh, costs associated with, with what we're about to, to present here. So that's the scope of work. I'm going to give you some uh, top line conclusions and my colleagues will jump in with their own slides with a little bit more uh, detail about the assumptions, the methodologies, and also the uh, interpretation of the data that, uh, or excuse me, the results that, uh, that I'm just simply going to mention here. So the first top line conclusion is about electricity. If the Diablo Canyon uh, license was extended by 10 years, so from 2025 to 2035, um, it would result in a reduction of California power sector carbon emissions by more than 10% annually with respect to 2017 levels. And that mostly would come from a, a, a reduced reliance on natural gas, which would be part of the generation mix that would replace the Apple Canyon if it were shut down. Now, the analysis that, that we do also allows for quantification of the savings in terms of power system costs associated with different scenarios. And the scenario where the Apple Canyon is contained in operation, uh, we basically realized order of $2.6 billion in savings in power system costs between 2025 and 2035. And because it is firm capacity, dispatchable capacity, it would bolster the system ability to mitigate brownouts. And we had sort of a, a, an example in August 2020, not just of the brownouts, but also the ability of Diablo Canyon to operate reliably throughout, uh, throughout that, uh, that, that mini crisis. If the uh, uh, license was extended for Diablo Canyon was extended an additional 10 years, so from 2025 to 2045, then the value of Diablo Canyon becomes even higher. And that's because it's during that second decade that the drive towards deep decarbonization makes clean, firm, dispatchable capacity even more valuable. So our uh, analysis suggests that during that period, Diablo Canyon could save up to $21 billion in power system costs. And importantly, could spare 90,000 acres of land from use for generation production, primarily uh, solar photovoltaic panels, while meeting coastal protection requirements. That's the intake question that we're going to uh, tackle in a few minutes. 
The second top line conclusion is about desalination. Um, we look at four different sizes of desalination plants that could be co-located at the Diablo Canyon site using part or all of the uh, uh, power output from the, uh, from, the, from, from the power plant. The smallest size, it's actually a fairly large uh, desalination plant size in absolute terms. It's uh, comparable to the existing desalination plant in operation at Carlsbad further down the coast. And that would produce a um, uh, volume of water that would be sufficient to alleviate some of the water shortages that you see, uh, particularly in the central coast. If you were to go to a much, much larger uh, desalination plant, one of the options that we looked at, that would use the whole power output of Diablo Canyon, then the amount of water produced would be truly enormous, enormous and it would actually exceed the uh, volume that is expected from the proposed the Delta Conveyance Project, but at a significantly lower investment cost. And Professor Nier will give you will give details about this particular analysis. Um, top line conclusion about hydrogen. A co-located hydrogen plant would have significant synergies with the Diablo plant in terms of water feed, as well as cheap electricity, which is um, uh, supplied directly by, by the nuclear power plant. It would use heat assisted um, electrolysis, and it would produce a very, very large amount of hydrogen of the order of 110,000 tons per year, which is a significant fraction of the projected uh, demand, the California demand for, for hydrogen. And it would do so at a significantly lower cost, roughly half of the alternative, which would be hydrogen produced from solar and wind power drawn from the, uh, from the, uh, from the grid. And last but not least, the polygeneration approach. In this case, as I said earlier, it's sort of a mix and match of the above uh, product streams and, and revenue stream. And uh, in this case, we were able to quantify the effective value of Diablo Canyon in terms of dollars per megawatt hour of electricity uh, generator. And this polygeneration mode acts as a little bit of a multiplier. So we estimate that when it's done properly, this sort of triaging of electricity to the three different product streams, uh, it would actually, it could actually increase the uh, the value of Diablo Canyon in terms of dollars per megawatt hour by uh, by over fifty percent. Now, important point I want to make here before passing the baton to to my colleagues here is, while this is not intended to be a definitive study, the conclusions from all these analyses, in our opinion, warrant further consideration on extending the life of Diablo Canyon plant beyond 2025. We seek here to sort of start the debate, not to end the debate. But again, our analysis are pretty, pretty compelling in our opinion. So with that, let me stop. And uh, EJ, I think you are next. Thank you, Jacopo. Uh, next slide, please. Great. So for the analysis for the electricity sector, we utilize a very detailed capacity and expansion uh, sorry, capacity expansion and dispatch model called ERBS. And this is a model that has previously been utilized to model California energy policy. For those of you who may not be as familiar, a detailed capacity expansion and dispatch model try to find the lowest cost system while taking into consideration California's future policy goals, uh, future load growth, as well as uh, developing technology prices. And it's very much similar to the model that's utilized for California's long-term integrated resource planning process. And I want to emphasize that when I say system costs today, it's not only taking into consideration the investment costs that's needed to uh, you know, invest in and build capacity, but also the corresponding annual operating costs. And this model in particular, ERBS, we actually simulate all uh, 8,760 hours in a given year to ensure that whatever system is designed and built maintains reliability for that model year. So it's, it's quite a robust model that we're working with. And so with this model, we modeled California's future energy systems through 2030. And I wanna mention again that Senate Bill 100 mandates a 60% renewable portfolio standard in California uh, in 2030. And that's reflected in the model runs here. And what we find is that even assuming rapid and unconstrained build out of renewable energy, particularly PV resources, we find that the continued operation of Diablo Canyon has the potential to significantly reduce California's use of natural gas for electricity production by approximately 10 terawatt hours per year. And just to provide some context, 
That's more than the output of the state's older gas peaker and once through cooling units that operated in 2018. And of course, by reducing the reliance on natural gas within the state, maintaining Diablo Canyon in the near term can reduce the California carbon emissions by an average of 7 million tons of CO2 per year, which is approximately uh, an 11% reduction uh, from the electricity sector relative to 2017. Next slide, please. And so with that, we find that maintaining Diablo Canyon uh, can actually save a total system cost of approximately $2.6 billion in the decadal period between 2025 and 2035. And I really want to emphasize this has been brought up uh, by Arun, Steve, and Jacopo before, really the importance of clean firm electric capacity and, and its value, especially during electric reliability events such as that, that happened in August of 2020. And to provide some context, in August 2020, the, the shortage that the state experienced was on the order of approximately a gigawatt. And if Diablo Canyon weren't online, uh, that would have grown to more than three gigawatts. So it's quite a significant capacity of clean firm dispatchable resource that we're discussing today. Next slide, please. Finally, uh, we also modeled a more long-term scenario that assumed that California would reach a net zero carbon grid by 2045 consistent with SB 100 and the executive order B5518. And what we find is that even assuming uh, really that the siting of new renewable resources was unconstrained by any land use considerations, we find that keeping Diablo Canyon saves the state a total of approximately 15 to $16 billion between 2025 and 2050. And we also find that the system with Diablo Canyon would avoid the need for 18 gigawatts of solar PV to ensure reliable electricity generation. And that 18 gigawatts of solar PV could spare about 90,000 acres of land. And on the right side, what we've done is shown 90,000 acres of land relative to the Bay, uh, Bay Area here today. So it's quite a large amount of land that we'd be saving. Now, I want to make sure to, to mention that within the report, we also consider a wide range of other sensitivities, so please uh, feel free to go into there for more details, but I just want to share one more scenario here, and that is if siting of new PV were constrained by land use considerations to approximately 60 gigawatts, which is consistent with re uh, historic annual deployment rates, uh, the savings from Diablo Canyon would, of course, increase to up to $21 billion. And with that, I'll pass it on to John. So we looked at desalination at Diablo Canyon uh, because there are ample supplies of uh, both uh, electricity and uh, intake water capacity. The plant is on the coast. We found that Diablo Canyon could be a powerful driver of low cost desalination, potentially serving not simply urban users, but industrial and agricultural users as well. In particular, we found that a plant uh, situated at Diablo Canyon would potentially have costs that are about half as much uh, as a comparable plant such as Carlsbad, which is standalone and taking power from the grid using its own infrastructure. In fact, you can build much larger plants than Carlsbad if you use all of the capacity, uh, the electrical capacity of the plant. And so we modeled four different sizes, one that was Carlsbad scale, two that were 10 to 20 times that size, and another that was up to 100 times the size of the Carlsbad plant. The charts on the right-hand side of the screen show our uh, calculations in blue. Uh, these are water capacities in acre feet per year. Uh, so the Diablo Canyon option one is the Carlsbad size plant in the upper frame. We're comparing that here, that productivity to the annual shortfall in the coastal branch of the California aqueduct. In fact, it's a bit larger. And we're also comparing it to the central coast annual groundwater overdraft, which is comparable in size. Uh, in the lower frame, you can see uh, the full range of plants that we've been looking at, uh, option one, two, three, and four. Four is a mega plant. It would be uh, about 20 times the size of the largest plant that currently exists in the world. Um, and these are compared to uh, the Central Valley uh, Project's annual shortfall, the State Water Project's annual shortfall, San Joaquin Valley annual overdraft. And you can see that plants of varying sizes built at Diablo Canyon could have a very significant uh, impact on offsetting uh, these uh, shortfalls. In addition, you can see uh, in the uh, magenta column, uh, the proposed Delta conveyance project, uh, the high uh, volume scenario. 
And what we observe is that the Diablo Canyon plant uh, could provide uh, comparable volumes of water. In fact, at about half the investment cost and without the associated uh, disruption to the Sacramento River Delta. Next slide. Our costs, uh, our cost savings arise principally from uh, two factors. At smaller scales, we expect a cheaper price of electricity because we do not have the transmission charges. Uh, we are right at the plant. Uh, you don't have to send the electricity out over the grid. Uh, secondly, because we would be sharing, uh, taking advantage of the intake and outfall of the existing power plant, uh, those capital costs would not have to be laid onto the desalination plant. And so we think that we have savings in both domains. You can see that large scale at Diablo Canyon in the uh, uh, second column in the table uh, comes out with a, a water price of about 1200 per acre foot. Uh, using the same cost estimates, the same methodology, the Carlsbad plant would have a price of 2200 per acre foot. And if we went to mega scale at Diablo Canyon, the price could be even lower, uh, perhaps less than $1,000 an acre foot. This is very competitive uh, when the water market is highly stressed in California. Uh, so we think that uh, the large plants may have additional economies of scale. Uh, they are so large that it takes some effort to, uh, to actually figure out what those numbers would look like. But one thing that's very important to stress is that this desalination technology is effectively off the shelf. Plants of this type uh, exist in California already. They exist all around the world. Uh, the largest desalination plants in the world, uh, many of the largest ones take advantage of this technology. Uh, so it is very well established and, and well known. And I will hand it off to the next speaker. Hi, uh, this is Justin Aborn. I've worked on the hydrogen and uh, poly generation sections of this report. We analyzed hydrogen production at Diablo Canyon. Hydrogen, a very valuable energy commodity. And the size of the plant we analyzed uh, was based on two things. One, the forecast of the California Energy Commission hydrogen uh, con consumption forecast and the 110 million kilogram per year plant that uh, we selected is either 3% to or to 10% of the projected uh, consumption depending on whether you uh, use a high or a low forecast for the hydrogen consumption of California. And as has been mentioned earlier in uh, this presentation, the production of hydrogen uh, is with a companion nuclear power plant and desalination plant is especially helpful because of the water is the core source of the hydrogen and electricity is the primary expense of uh, producing hydrogen by electrolysis and as well the heat uh, steam available in the nuclear steam heat also improves hydrogen production. And we find uh, that the cost can range between two to two and a half dollars a kilogram, which is a very competitive price. Uh, on the graph at right, this we compare the, the Diablo Canyon projections, the, the range from two to two and a half dollars is in the center. And on the left, that uh, compares with uh, steam methane reformation with, with carbon sequestration. And, and that's the price range on the left. And on the right is uh, hydrogen produced using purely renewable sources with a 30% capacity factor, which actually makes that electricity fairly expensive. Uh, why don't we go ahead to the next slide. And this uh, discusses the poly generation mode of operating the, th the uh, three elements of Diablo Canyon, electricity, hydrogen, and desalination. And the analysis divided up the, the electricity uh, produced by Diablo Canyon in approximately 60% being sold as electricity or ancillary services, 
20% being sold as uh, water and 20% being sold as hydrogen. And uh, we found that just looking at the revenue that would be uh, accessed by selling those commodities, we find that $70 per megawatt hour is the sort of earnings and a very significant fraction of that was water sales. Uh, but that $70 per megawatt hour of revenue compares very favorably to the projected cost per megawatt hour of $54 per megawatt hour. And depending on how prices for water and hydrogen evolve, uh, the earnings per megawatt hour at Diablo Canyon could be much higher than that $70. And, uh, you know, $82 to $100 a megawatt hour is uh, within the range of, of believability. Uh, and with that, I will pass on to uh, the next presenter, which I think is Jakob. I think it's back to me, yes. Okay, so a, a major uh, issue in the process that led to the decision to uh, shut down Diablo Canyon uh, was the uh, ability of the plant to cope with uh, California water quality control policy. Um, any industrial installation that uses uh, seawater for cooling or other purposes is expected in California to effectively reduce drastically uh, the destruction of marine life in the form of uh, fish eggs and, and larvae by 93%. There are two fundamentally two approaches here. Either one reduces the intake flow rate by 93%, and that for a power plant like Diablo Canyon might mean uh, switching from one stroke cooling to, for example, cooling power. That approach was looked at um, in 2014. The GNE commissioned a study by Bechtel that looked at the cost and feasibility of those cooling towers and concluded it would be very, very expensive and the environmental impact of the cooling towers would be uh, otherwise high. That's approach number one. Approach number two is to come up with a uh, uh, maintaining the same flow rate. Uh, of the uh, of seawater to the plant, but reduce the destruction of marine life by reducing entrainment and impingement uh, impingement of, of marine life for the uh, for the intake itself. So, as part of our study, we spent a great deal of time uh, in identifying and examining alternative technologies that could accomplish that objective. And the one that we focus on is shown here, and essentially it's a mechanical brush clean wet fire screen that would be located offshore and then connected to the uh, uh, to the condenser to the power plant with uh, with an underground uh, with an underground tunnel. Um, the uh, the screens are such that they rotate and they rotate against some mechanical some some brushes that essentially keep them clean, and this is absolutely. Uh, crucial because you want to maintain the passages or the you know the slits where the water goes through uh, free of any obstruction uh, so that the velocity of the water will basically remain nice and low and just to get quantitative uh, the uh, size of the of the mesh that uh, we selected here is of the order of one millimeter and the uh, slit velocity is of the order of 0.5 uh, feet per second. And those are consistent with the expectations of the regulations in, in California. But this particular technology is, is actually not, not new. It's been used uh, widely in the United States uh, for both freshwater and, and seawater applications. Uh, it's currently being considered for Huntington Beach desalination plant, which is not in operation yet, and is currently being tested for the Carlsbad um, uh, desalination plant that was uh, that was mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, also along the, the, the coast of California. If this technology was adopted for Diablo Canyon, there would need to be a test done of the effectiveness of this technology in the particular marine environment uh, uh, at the Diablo Canyon site. We work with a uh, uh, with a uh, with a California-based uh, company that actually commercializes the technology, and together we did a techno-economic uh, feasibility. Uh, study and, and obtain a quote that uh, is uh, accounted for is integrated in our in our cost uh, in our cost uh, uh, assessment. So we think, bottom line, that there is a solution to the uh, intake.
problem and it's a solution that is affordable and effective consistent with california regulations all right so let me take this to the finish line here we have focused primarily on the value of the applicant there is no shortage of course of challenges if in fact the decision is made to uh, extend the license of the plan first the nuclear regulatory commission has to issue that uh, license extension. Uh, the NRC typically takes between a year and a half to two years to do that review. It's become fairly routine. Uh, all but Diablo Canyon nuclear reactors in the United States have obtained actually a uh, license extension from 40 to 60 years. Some are going from 60 to 80 years. But that process has to take place again for Diablo Canyon. And we think reasonably, uh, realistically, the uh, application uh, for the license extension ought to be resubmitted uh, before mid of 2023 for the NRC to be able to, to complete it in time. The good news is that NRC allows for the plan to operate pending uh, review of the application. The, um, the second challenge, of course, is to obtain approval for any uh, engineered uh, water intake system that I just described, as well as uh, for the licensing of the brine discharge from the desalination process if that um, if, a, if a new outfall is is warranted for for the different size desalination plants and things like that um, number three approval for construction of adjacent or distributed desalination plants and hydrogen electrolysis facilities that we discuss including the associated pipes and transmission wires um, we know very well the uh, climate in, in uh, California around uh, nuclear is highly controversial. So there will be stakeholders who are part also of the settlement leading to the closure of the plant that would need to be engaged. And there is uh, sort of environmental opposition in principle among some of the some to the use of nuclear energy in any form for any purpose. A very interesting and important question is what would be the ownership um, and operation of the plant going forward. We did not spend um, a lot of time on this in our study. We, there are a few options that seem obvious, but GNE continues to be the owner and operator or a subcontract to different company to run it, or the state could even take on ownership and subcontract the company and, and, comp and company to run it. Uh, once again, this study was not intended to be and should not be considered a definitive analysis uh, of the benefits and trade-offs that we have that we have discussed so far. We want to start a debate, but once again, the findings are sufficiently compelling in our opinion uh, to uh, warrant that debate to actually start. And so we, we basically offer this information to, to uh, the important uh, uh, stakeholders in California, and we hope that that, that debate will take place. And with that, I'll stop sharing the slides. I think those, it's back to you. Yeah, um, well, we have a few minutes. Um, we finished a little early. Congratulations to the MIT team for being so succinct. But Jacobo, I think maybe we could take a, a few minutes to do something that I know you've analyzed, which is the safety considerations of uh, the nuclear plant, given where it's located. And perhaps you could uh, shed some light on that in our extra time here. Well, thanks for asking that question. And I'm going to use a uh, Maybe a backup slide here. Let me share again. So the, uh, the safety record of Diablo Canyon is actually very, very strong over the past three decades. Uh, the, uh, the, the key safety related question for this particular plant is the seismic hazard. We know that the Diablo Canyon, well, first of all, California in general is a highly seismic region. And Diablo Canyon in particular is built uh, relatively close to, to, certain, uh, to certain fault lines. So in the wake of the Fukushima accident in 2011, the accident that took place in Japan, the NRC reviewed the Diablo Canyon's ability to withstand external events. That's jargon that we use to indicate things like earthquakes, tsunamis, floods, tornadoes, wildfires, hurricanes, as well as terrorist attacks uh, of exceptional rare and severe magnitude. Now, the NRC spent literally at this point nine years uh, with their state-of-the-art seismic methodologies. Uh, and uh, the Diablo Canyon was subject to a series of new evaluations, uh, both generic, which means really similar to all other nuclear power plants uh, in the United States, and some specific, specific to Diablo Canyon site, of course. So, for example, already mentioned, Diablo Canyon is close to various, to various faults, uh, faults. And at the same time, Diablo Canyon is a very high elevation. So, for example, the concerns uh, related to floods are, are greatly mitigated. So, at the end of that long process, uh, the NRC conclusion, which is embodied by a letter 
uh, issue just a little bit over a year ago, is that the existing seismic capacity uh, or effective flood protection of Diablo Canyon uh, will address the unbound with reevaluated assets. And that's sort of technical uh, language that says Diablo was basically designed and built to withstand even the rarest and strongest earthquakes that are physically possible at the site. And further, the staff confirmed that the conclusions in the various staff assessments continue to support the determination that no further regulatory actions are required to be allocated. In other words, there is no need for additional retrofits and design modifications to address the, the, the seismic hazard. That's on the prevention side. In terms of mitigation, uh, as an additional level of protection, all nuclear plants in the United States, Diablo Canyon included, have been actually retrofitted with special equipment and procedures that are called FLEX. So FLEX is a, a set of equipment and procedures that are meant to ensure effectively reliable and cooling of the reactor core, which is one of the key uh, nuclear safety functions, and of the spent fuel pool under a hypothetical scenario in which all the engineer safety systems have been disabled by a severe external event. And then last but not least, of course, like all other nuclear power plants, Diablo's is compliance with these post Fukushima rules is subject to continuous monitoring uh, by the NRC under what they call the reactor oversight process. So, we, you know, in a nutshell, we think that the, uh, both the safety record as well as the newly conducted evaluations for, uh, for Diablo Canyon um, are, are all very positive. Thanks for asking the questions. Uh, Jacobo, let me ask you one other because I think we still have a few minutes. Um, I think the concept of polygeneration is not something that you hear frequently in the discussion. So when you think of this uh, facility, it already has, does it not, uh, a, um, a uh, desal, um, desal plant that's attached to it. Uh, how, how could you do all three things? Is it, uh, when we think of polygeneration, are we thinking of it as providing power to the grid? power for a hydrogen facility and also a desal, or are we thinking that you have to choose a couple of these out of the three? I'm gonna let Justin uh, answer this one since he can out. Sure, Justin, and uh, the notion that we analyzed is the idea of operating all three at once. And that is the analysis that uh, the revenue section of the report took up. Uh, there, and uh, as I mentioned, about uh, sixty percent. The, the production of Diablo Canyon is divided up according to the electricity production it's capable of. So you take the total number of megawatt hours that the plant can produce, and uh, approximately sixty percent of that production is allocated to electricity products, whether it be energy or ancillary services for the grid. And uh, the next 22 sets of 20%, 20% approximately to producing hydrogen and 20% approximately to um, uh, producing Water, yes. So twenty percent of the electricity <laughs> driving <laughs> driving the desalination plant. It's it's that allocation and the model and the, what the report presents is a uh, a steady allocation between those three products throughout an entire year. And the twenty percent of water goes to which of the different scenarios? How much water would that produce? And the 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 twenty percent figure. Uh, reflects option two of the uh, four different options of desalination plant right. outlined. Okay, well, very good. Um, as we in California know, the issues of water are very severe on the Central Coast. So uh, it, it can either go to the Central Valley or the Central Coast, but the Central Coast is actually cut off from some of the state water projects. So uh, it definitely would be valuable. Well, I think at this point, um, we've had uh, a very good report. Uh, let me just remind people that there is a, a media Q&A that starts at 1.30, but more importantly, any people who are interested in the report ought to download it. Uh, they were only given a short period of time to present a very detailed report with very thoughtful suggestions in it. So we really recommend that if you're interested in this, that you download the report and take a look at it. In the meantime, we certainly want to thank all the people that helped to put this together, the various institutes and our speakers. 
and certainly to Arun and Steve for taking time out in their busy schedules to put this very important issue into the context. And so uh, with that, I will uh, close off the meeting and we will prepare for the media Q&A that will follow in a few minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.